Uh, this morning we have a very special guest with us, Pastor David Strunk. He is surely no stranger to our church, so will you give a warm welcome to Pastor David Strunk. This, the, hey, that's better. Hey, man, I won't have to work near as hard now. George, age 92, and Edith, age 89, had been seeing each other for two years when they decided that life was too short and they might as well be together for the rest of their lives. So excited about their decision to become newlyweds, they went for a stroll to discuss the wedding and what plans needed to be made. Along their way, they found themselves in front of a drugstore. George said to his bride-to-be, let's go in, I have an idea. They walked to the rear of the store and addressed the man behind the counter. George asked, are you the owner? The pharmacist answered, yes, sir, I am. How can I help you? George, do you sell heart medications? Pharmacists, of course we do. George, how about support holes for circulation? Pharmacists, definitely. George, what about medications for rheumatism, osteoporosis, and arthritis? The pharmacist, all kinds. George, how about waterproof furniture pads and depends? Pharmacist, yes, sir. George, hearing aids, denture supplies, and reading glasses. Pharmacist, yes. George, what about eye drops, sleeping pills, Geritol, Preparation H, and x lax Pharmacist, absolutely. George, you sell wheelchairs, walkers, and canes. Pharmacist, all kinds and sizes. Why all these questions? George smiled and glanced shyly at Edith and replied to the pharmacist, we've decided that we're going to get married and we'd like to use your store as our bridal registry. <laughs> that, that encourages me. I never can tell you how special it is to me to be here. I went to the, the Bible Baptist Seminary in 1957, graduated in 1961. One of the great honors of my life was to preach a revival meeting when Dr. Odom was pastor of this church. Another great honor of my life was preaching revival meetings for Pastor Loveless. And I want you to know, and I know you know this, this isn't a voting contest for him, it's just sincere praise from my heart, but you've got a great pastor and his wife. It's hard to get the whole enchilada. I have preached literally, and I preach meetings, those of you that know me, all my ministry. The 38 years I pastored Blanding Boulevard Baptist in Jacksonville, I was going a lot in meetings. That's just the way God put it in my DA and provided the wherewithal to be able to do that. I've been in a lot of churches, a lot of places. I've seen preachers' wives tear up more in five minutes than even build up in five years. And it's just wonderful when you get a true pastor with a pastor's heart. That's what Brother Loveless has, a pastor's heart and a great wife to compliment his ministry 
and then you have a wonderful staff and you're just a great church and we love you and we're honored to be here uh, one of my heroes in the past and one of my heroes right now is the caches i think about them all the time and every time i see them i'm encouraged because i've never known two greater servants of god in consistency and faithfulness in season out of season up down round round uh, they are top shelf larry brundage it was so good to see him he's aged a lot more than me but i I've, but larry brundage i love him and uh, and you know we grew up together and then i grew out then i've seen so many others and then brother langley's daughter susan and her husband is here today and i was so delighted to see them and many others of you and uh, I am so, so, so blessed uh, and honored to be able to be back here at Calvary Baptist Church. Now, I want you to open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach now all, all messages and all the Bibles important. But out of, out of anything that I could preach at Calvary today, this would be, to me, one of the most important messages I could preach to those of us who are saved that will determine our attitude, and remember your attitude determines your altitude. And what we'll talk about today will determine your happiness, your peace, your joy in the Lord. And I just trust that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts as we consider this subject today about forgiveness, forgiveness. And we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. If you're there, say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 4. And as we look there together, because nothing speaks of the Bible better than the Bible itself. That's page 1806 in my Bible. And we're beginning in verse number 21, where the Bible says, and I never get tired of hearing that, the Bible says, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, if we were members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And here it is. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now I would like for you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 6 we'll read verses 14 and 15 Matthew chapter 6 beginning in verse number 14 for if ye forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you. 
But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, that's what I want the Holy Spirit to stab into our hearts this morning. The truth of what is so plainly stated here, you don't need a preacher, a pastor, a teacher, as a Christian to understand this. It's plain. It's, it's right there. Simply says that if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Ladies and gentlemen, that is an awesome, awesome thing. Uh, the reason why I believe we have so many anemic Christians today, and I'm sorry to say that I know a lot of preachers and pastors, instead of getting better in their lives, they've gotten bitter. I decided a long time ago that by the grace of God, no matter how long I live and what I go through, I would like to get better and not be bitter. And if you are holding an unforgiving spirit in your heart towards anybody about anything, anything, I'm not going to say that you can't be saved. Certainly you can be. So a lot of people are saved and get bitter and not better. A lot of people that are saved do carry around an unforgiving spirit in their heart. But I am telling you today that if you are really saved, if you're saved, born again, child of God, say amen. amen. I'm talking to you, and amen, I'm talking to me. If we were, are really saved, born again, child of God, will you come up here, sir, please? Now, my wife gets nervous when I go down steps now, so you're going to stand by me. Give me your hand so that I don't stumble when I'm on my way down. And you say, preacher, doesn't that embarrass you? Not the least bit. <laughs> Not the least bit. I'd rather do that than fall on my face. That's what would be embarrassing. Loretta trembles. And then, and then my wife, Loretta, we've been married 56 years now. And uh, she'll say, honey, why do you carry on about your age? Why do you do that? I said, because it's fun. I, I mean, it's better to laugh than cry, you know. And I said, I like to, I want to encourage people. I've always tried to be an encourager, and I like to encourage people and be honest about it. I'm going to tell you what, this growing old something. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I used, I used to wonder. I did, and I didn't do this judgmentally, but I used to wonder why old people like me would get up real slow, you know, and I'd watch them do that, and then I'd watch them, you know, and I didn't do this, but, but they'd get up real slow, and then, they, then they'd start walking. And I would think to myself, why don't they just get up and go? And you know what? If you live long enough, and I'd like to see some of you get there, if you live long enough, you will find out what it's all about. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a positive. I got a message I just prepared. I've been preaching several places about why I'm an optimist. I am an optimist. Why shouldn't we be? We're saved, born again Christians. We know what we're doing here, how we got here, where we're going, how we're going to get there. And we're on the winning side. Amen. We're not trusting the Democrats or the Republicans or the, or the hey, somebody said, I don't, I'm not Republican or Democrat. They're both flying the same old bird. I mean, I'm here to tell you, our trust is in Him. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Well, I'm an optimist, but I'm going to tell you, folks, it ain't going to get better on this age thing. I read something the other day. I like you guys. I, I, I read something the other day that said, if you exercise like you should and you eat like you should, you can add two years to your life. And I told Loretta, I'd rather have the donut. <laughs> you know, you know what? You know what? By the grace of God, I'd like to live till I die and not die while I'm living. 
And a lot of people are dying while they're living. Because, and whatever you do, don't buy a hypochondriac, a medical book. You'll pay for it for the rest of your life. Now, God wants to get our attention. And by the way, he knows how to get our attention. He does. You say, well, I'll get their attention. Don't let, let God take care of it. He knows how to do it. Can you see a little bit of Dennis the Menace in me, just a touch of it? I'm on, I want to tell you about something so bad my teeth ache. I might have told you before, but it's one of my favorites about the four deer hunters that went deer hunting, and they just had two tents. So two to a tent, and one guy was a horrible snorer. So they flipped a coin to see who would go in first to sleep with that guy. And so the first guy went in, and the next morning he'd come out just all blurry-eyed, and, and they said, how'd you do? He said, oh, it was horrible. I couldn't sleep a bit. I was awake all night. They flipped a coin. The second guy went in. The same thing happened to him. And then, they flipped, and then the third guy went in. And that next morning, he'd come out all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and feeling good. And they said, said, man, how in the world did you do that? And he said, well, I listened to that horrible snoring as long as I could take it. And I tapped him on the shoulder. And when he turned over, I kissed him. And he watched me all night. <laughs> well, well. Well, he got his attention. And I'm going to tell you what, God knows how to get our attention. And he wants our attention when it comes to this matter of forgiveness. Now, did God mean what he said when he said, if you don't forgive them, I won't forgive you? Did he mean that? So for just a couple of hours now, just two hours, I want to give you just two things about this matter of forgiving. Are you still awake? Number one, I like you. Number one, we need to forgive others. No matter what they've done to you, when they did it, how many times they did it, how mean and spiteful it was, we've got to forgive others for anything. Now, I was, those of you that have heard me preach in the past, uh, not real often, but, but periodically, I mention about my upbringing. I was saved at 13 years of age in Orlando, Florida, at the Orlando Baptist Temple, 4470 West Colonial Drive, of the ministry of Robert E. Fleming, who was a brother to Gerald Fleming, the pastor of Dayton Baptist Temple in Dayton, Ohio. I got saved at 13. My dad hated God. My mother was saved when she was 15. She married out of the will of God to a man who was unsaved and hated God in the church. My dad threatened my mother's life when she was just a, just a teenage girl that he would kill her if she kept going to church. Threatened and told her she was in love with a preacher and all that garbage. So mother stayed out of the will of God all those years until my older sister, Pat, who's married to Harold Brown in Vernon, Texas, a great pastor, uh, my older sister, Pat, she's two years old, and I, she was 15, I was 13. Mother was out of the will of God all those years until that Sunday morning when my sister and I got saved. That's the greatest time of your life. And by the way, if you've really been saved, you remember it. Unless you have dementia, you, you'll remember when you got saved. Salvation is too wonderful to receive and not know when you got it, you see. You might have forgot the exact date, but you'll know if it was... Sunday, Sunday morning or night, you will know when you got saved. I hope you know that you're saved. And we got saved. And I want to tell you, that was, that, the whole, our home life was never good. I was telling a great pastor friend of mine this past week here in the Metroplex area, I said, you know, we were talking about our upbringing, and I said, said I don't remember a lot about when I was a little kid. Do it? any of you... Uh, uh, folks of my generation remember a lot about when you were three or four years old. The one big thing I remember was going down a, a sidewalk on a tricycle, and it, it went down, and then it curved right to go to the porch, and you know what happened. It got to going, I picked my feet up and went off the end and crashed. That's the main thing I remember about being three years old. But this I remember. My dad was in the Navy, and he was stationed in Houston, Texas for a couple of years, and when we were in Houston, I was somewhere between that four and five year mark. 
And I remember my mother said, he'd been out to sea six months, and my mother said, your dad's coming home today. And I wasn't happy about it. And then I, when she said, I see him coming now, I do remember this. I remember that I went and hid. I went into the bedroom and hid myself because I was afraid of him. Something wrong with that picture. Now, the best thing that ever happened to me when I got saved, the next best thing that ever happened to me was when I left home at 18 years of age, having never been gone but more than two or three days at a time, left Orlando, Florida in an old beat-up automobile uh, with bald-headed tires, a few dollars in my pocket, no interstate highway, and took off for, for Bible Baptist Seminary. And I'm going to tell you, we could write books about what happened on that trip. Oh, it, it, I, I mean, and the hardest thing was leaving my mother. I felt like I was somewhat of a little bit of protection for her. But it was still great for me because I got out from under that tension and that uh, because we saw bloody blackjacks and loaded 38s and my daddy had come in with a belly full of vodka and throw things and smack my mother around and terrorize my sister. Bottom line, it was one of the best things after I got saved when I left home at 18. It was a horrible home life. And that's not all of it. It went on and on and on and on. I do, got to, I do have, need to tell you that, thank God, after 16 years of prayer and not, not even knowing where Dad was for years, uh, for, in years, not even knowing where he was or if he was alive, by the grace of God, Dad got saved, uh, yet so as by fire, but he got saved. Hallelujah. Now, I can truthfully say, now this is God, this isn't me. I couldn't do this. But I can truthfully say I never hated my dad. I was afraid of him. But I I never hated him. I can truthfully say it was just God. had to be. I never questioned God, why has this happened to me? Why did this have to happen to us? I didn't do that. And I can truthfully say that because I didn't hate him, without even understanding it as a a young teenage man, I forgave him in my heart before it even happened, I forgave him. I forgave him. I forgave him. Even though he said when I told him I wanted to go to the Bible Baptist Seminary, he got mad and stood up and threw a chair across the little old dining room we had and, and cursed God in God's name and said, I'd rather see you dead than in that blankety-blank seminary and you'll never get a dime out of me. And I never did get a dime out of him, but God's not broke. See? And God provided for us, as he always does, because when when God calls, he equips. And he supplies the need. Had a horrible, but I never held animosity and hatred in my, I forgave him. And because of that, I had peace. And because of that, God took those experiences and used them to help me grow in grace and take what happened to me and learn from it and not just sympathize with young people, but empathize with them when they've walked the aisles by the scores at Blanding, crying and saying, pray for my dad, pray for my mother. They're alcoholics, they're this, they're that. I had a feeling that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Whatever happens to you in your life, Christian, and remember, anything that happens to anybody else can happen to you and happen to me, except we can't be lost and go to hell or ever be without the presence of Jesus Christ anything else can happen and it's all in God's hands he's a sovereign God and he's in total full control and anything over our head is under his feet Wow believe I feel a shout coming on that makes some of you nervous wouldn't it huh yeah well I get so happy when I'm able to talk about the grace of God and his leading in our life forgive Now, I've got to tell you this. In my ministry, I believe one of the most challenging things for me to deal with as a pastor was with abused women. Women, and now it's men too, not as much so in my generation did you find out about that, but abused women, incest and all that garbage. And, and, the, and seeing the, the psychological damage that that does when little girls and, hey, we can't relate to that. It's out of the ballpark with us. I don't understand it. But it happens. 
And I've seen the devastation, and I've counseled with the devastation that comes out of that with scores and scores of people. And yet I need to say to them, and I do say to them, because I see the wretchedness they go through, and, the, and the, of all things, the guilt that many of them carry themselves, which is far. I see that, and I let them know, listen, they say, preacher, what should I do? And I tell them, you've got to forgive them. Forgive them. No matter what, whoever did to you, no matter how horrible it was, we are commanded to forgive them because if we don't forgive them, God said, I won't forgive you. Is that what the Bible says? If you don't forgive them, I won't forgive you. Now, the reason why that's so hard for so many people to do is because they have the, they have the feeling. These, these, these women, these young women, these ladies, these girls will cry and say, I can't forgive them because it's like saying it's okay he did it. No, no, a million times no. You're not saying it's okay he did it or she did it. That's not, that, that's not true at all. It's horrible they did it. They ought to suffer the severest penalty of the law for it. It's not saying it's okay that it happened, but even with that, you've got to forgive them. You've got to forgive them for your own peace of mind, for your own health, for your own mental health and your physical health. You've got to forgive them and the biggest thing Thing is if you don't forgive them God's not going to forgive you you got to forgive them we had a young couple in our church Billy and Martha and they, of course there's scores of these things that happen over a 38 year ministry but but Billy and Martha had a little two year old toddler they lived out about 20 miles from Blanding out, out in Middleburg and, uh, and, and they had this little toddler and one day uh, the mother went to sleep and the little toddler got out of the house and, and went into a pond that was behind the house, got into that pond and drowned. So it was hideous. We had the funeral for that little girl and saw the, the crying and the wretchedness of the brokenness of their hearts. But the, the most hideous thing about the whole thing was that Billy would not forgive her. He said, I'll never forgive her. And the marriage was being devastated and she was sorrowful. Don't you know she was? She didn't do that. Listen. She didn't do that on purpose, and yet he would not forgive her. And he said, I will not, and I counsel with them and try to encourage them. And they said, I will not, I will not forgive. And he didn't forgive her, and that marriage crashed and burned. I'm going to tell you, to, to not forgive, to not forgive is hideous. Forgive them for whatever happened. Anything anybody ever did. Say, well, I'll tell you what, somebody in the church offended me. Hey, I offend myself. You want to see your biggest problem? Look in the mirror. You say, preacher, don't talk like that. We won't have you back. Well, I've got to tell the truth. We're our own biggest problem. Say amen. amen. I mean to tell you, we've all, hey, we're just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. At best, trying to do what's right. And needing God and help and encourage. And that's what I love about Calvary Baptist. Is because this is a church that's here to see each other through and not through each other. Thanks for sitting on spit row. <laughs> that takes courage with me. I'm here to tell you we've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. And you say, well, it means I forget. You know, we say, well, if you really forgive and you forget, don't be stupid. We got human brains and they work, we hope. We got brains and things will flash back. But if you've really forgiven, instead of bitterness, you'll have peace and say, you know what, I've forgiven them and God's, and God's forgiven me. And, and, and I'm going to, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to forgive others including somebody that's offended you in the church. They'll always be an offense. They'll always, hey, every church has a jerk. Or two. Or three. They do. Every one of them. I mean, every, 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 every church has one, some, one or some of these people that they pride themselves in saying, I'll tell you what, I say exactly what I think. You know what that is? That's stupid. That'll get you in trouble. If we said what we thought, can you imagine how many times we'd have been shot before today? 
We're to control our tongue. It's a, it's a weapon. We're to we're control that. But these people say, and there's people that say smart aleck things. And by the way, if you kid with people, make sure you can take it too. You ever know anybody like that? Don't look around now. If you ever know anybody like that? They can really dish it out, but if they can't take it and they get offended. Hey, there's going to always be some kind of problem. There'll always be some kind of misunderstanding. Remember the guy that went to the drugstore and went back to the pharmacist and said, what do you got for a bad case of hiccups? And he said, he said, come here. And he took the guy, dragged him behind the counter and beat the fire out of him. Just slapped him around, boxed him till he's bleeding. And the guy said, what in the world did you do that for? And the guy, the pharmacist said, you don't have the hiccups now, do you? He said, I didn't have them, you dummy. My wife's got them. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what. You, you know what? That, that's certainly a misunderstanding, isn't it? Hey, and as long as we're alive... Are you alive? Say amen. amen. As long as we're alive, there's going to be misunderstandings. But God's bigger than the misunderstandings. Now I've got to land this plane. Are you still awake? We've got to forgive others. And secondly, secondly, and my wife says, honey, when you do that, have you really forgot? <laughs> and I say, you'll never know. <laughs> we need to forgive others. And secondly, <laughs> are you in love? <laughs> And secondly, as I'm on my way out the door, and secondly, we need to, are you still awake? We need to forgive ourselves. I don't know who and don't need to, don't want to. But some in this auditorium today, you're carrying around a heavy load of guilt that you don't need to carry around. My Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from A double L, all sin. What well, look, Paul murdered Christians and thought he was doing God a favor. Do you remember that? He thought he and that's why I said, forgetting those things, I press forward because he'd have been in a total state of depression if he'd have dwelled on the past. I'm going to tell you, when we got saved, Jesus separated our sins as far away from us as the east is from the west to be remembered against us no more. He didn't just cover our sins. He annihilated our sins. Amen. And you know something? You're not mad at me, are you? <laughs> you know something? When God looks upon us, he looks upon us as if we've never sinned through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ooh, I think I feel a shout coming on. And I'm talking about past, present, and future sin. The judgment seat of Christ that's just for Christians is not a judgment of sin. If it were, we would all go to hell. It's a judgment of works. And the curse of sin is what he keeps us from doing for Jesus. But it's God looks upon us as if we have never, ever sinned through the blood of Jesus. Oh, what about sin in the life of the Christian? God disciplines us as his children. In the, in the, not in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty now and now. Your husband might not forgive you. Your wife might not forgive you. God forbid. Your kids might not forgive you. God forbid. Your parents might not forgive you. God forbid. But I want you to know today, God forgives. He forgives and he forgets. And you don't have to carry around that load of guilt which robs you of the joy of the Lord's salvation. There's a lady, a woman that I know, that I've known for decades. She is, a, she is a Christian woman that was very faithful in church. She's in glory now, but she was faithful in church for decades. But she was very judgmental. She said, how could she be a good Christian? Well, she was. She was faithful. She died. She, she, she helped people. 
but she was very judgmental. Why? Well, hey, watch out for people that are super judgmental. You know, you can be in a group and all at once you say, and then came the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Then came the Pharisees. She was very pharisaical. Now, long story longer. The bottom line of this is, about two years before she died, she came forward in an invitation and she said, Pastor, crying like a baby, she said, Pastor, can I talk to you after church? I said, yeah. And I mean, always with somebody there in the office and the blinds open and the doors, pastors protect, which we should. She came to the office and she said, I've been living with something for decades. It's been eating me alive. And I said, well, I can't help you if you don't tell me what it is. And she through tears, blinding her eyes. She said, I had an abortion when I was a teenager. Said there was a guy that raped me. And I've become pregnant, and my sister talked me into getting an abortion. And I killed that baby. And, and I, I've never believed God could forgive me of that. And thank God the Holy Spirit come down in there. And it was like a light coming on when she understood God forgives any sin. All sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin. No matter what, where, when, who, how many times you get it under the sweet blood of Jesus and dump that load of guilt and have the joy of the Lord in your heart and show people that you can overcome anything by the grace of God and be a sweet Christian for the Lord Jesus. Amen.